Good morning, uh, and welcome to this year's session of TED Style Talks. I'm Chris Kniff, and I work at Wild Cornell Medical College in New York. I'm excited to introduce our two amazing speakers for this morning, but before that, I need to provide you with my disclosures, which include serving on advisory boards for Biogen and Amgen, and as a consultant to Sterigenics. Our first speaker, Dr. Steve Cole, is a professor of medicine and psychiatry and biobehavioral sciences at the UCLA School of Medicine, where he directs the Social Genomics Core Laboratory. He received his PhD at Stanford University, and over the last two decades, he staked out one of the most interesting and impactful areas of genetic and genomic research today, the examination of how social and environmental factors influence the way that the human genome responds. I first heard Dr. Cole speak about 15 years ago at the University of Arizona, and I remember telling my family and my colleagues and anyone else who would listen about his groundbreaking work on how our immunogenetic profiles are changeable and are closely tied to our emotional experience with the world and how these genetic changes can influence our health and well-being. And so today I'm looking forward to follow up of that important story of the ways that social processes interact with our genome to shape development, health, and behavior. Our second speaker, Dr. Janina Jeff, is a proud native of New Orleans and a senior bioinformatics scientist who received her PhD in human genetics at Vanderbilt University and whose academic career includes investigation of population genetics, admixed population, and risk factors for common disease. Dr. Jeff is also the host and executive producer of the award-winning podcast, In Those Genes which addresses genetics through the lens of black culture. In 2020, she won the ASHG Advocacy Award, the youngest recipient to ever receive this honor. The title of her talk today is 46 Chromosomes and a Mule, which is a reference to the story of 40 Acres and a Mule, a systematic post-Civil War attempt to provide reparations and one of the many broken promises of inclusion made to previously enslaved persons. Her talk today, will address racial health disparities and the lack of diversity in our current genetics research, and we'll discuss solutions to these ongoing problems. Good morning. I am Steve Cole, and I study the everyday life of the human genome. Um, if only I were so lucky to be paid handsomely by pharma for these explorations, that would be great. But alas, that's not the case, so I have uh, no financial disclosures to report here. Um, in fact, most of genetics historically has kind of thought what I was doing was crazy. So um, I think usually I start off talks trying to explain a little bit about how I got into this sort of weird line of work in the first place. And it was really motivated by results like these. So these are data from a molecular epidemiologic study in which we're looking at gene expression, the level of RNA transcripts present in a bunch of uh, immune cells from people exposed to high versus low levels of one of the most toxic environmental risk factors known to epidemiology. And in this heat plot, rows correspond to individuals, um, columns correspond to one of about 200 or so genes that were found to differ in their average activity level by 20% or more uh, in people exposed to high levels of the risk factor versus low levels of the risk factor. And to the extent that the cell defined by the row of an individual in the column of a gene is red, that just means high activity of that gene in that person's immune cells. So um, high transcription rates, high messenger RNA abundance, basically. To the extent that the cell is colored green, that means relatively low expression of that gene. And all these organized blocks of red and green are really telling us is that in the immune cells of people exposed to high levels of this risk factor, there's 70 or so genes that are systematically more active, producing more RNA, as a result, more protein and changing the functional characteristics of those cells. Another 130 or so genes systematically less active in people exposed to this risk factor. And it turns out that these 200 or so genes aren't just a random smattering of all 20,000 or so genes in the human genome. They actually represent a couple of coherent themes or organized conspiracies, if you will. So um, for instance, prominent among the genes that are upregulated 
are a block that are involved in inflammation or the body's first line of defense against uh, an injury and the initiation of an immune response. Um, prominent among the genes that are downregulated in people exposed to high levels of the risk factor are a couple of blocks of genes involved in defending us against intracellular pathogens, particularly viruses, so like type 1 interferons that help us resist viral infections and a particular isotype of antibodies. So this kind of coordinated shift in what the immune cell is doing with its genomic resources, I don't think would be particularly surprising if the kind of risk factor that we were looking at in this particular study were the kinds of physical, chemical, or microbial stimuli that I think we all kind of intuitively most worry about in epidemiology, things like um, benzene in the drinking water or you know, sort of Zika virus or coronavirus or something like that. But what got me interested in this line of research is that the risk factor that is structuring these particular differences in gene expression is really simply the extent to which the people in the first few rows of the heat plot feel disconnected from the rest of humanity. It's loneliness that was structuring these differences in gene expression. And that, for me, was a little bit more of a head scratcher. I couldn't figure out um, why it is that the human genome should be changing its sort of functional biology in immune cells based upon what kind of a social life we're leading as a whole organism. So um, that kind of kicked off a long exploration of, you know, sort of a number of topics that, that kind of come up, like is isolation uniquely sort of wired down to genome function? Actually, it turns out that's not the case. What we discovered as we did more research in this area is that in fact, social isolation is one of many types of adverse life circumstances that seem to evoke fairly similar changes in white blood cell gene expression. So increased inflammatory gene expression, reduced antiviral gene expression. We see this in contexts ranging from poverty to warfare to post-traumatic stress to even chronic discrimination. So these kinds of shifts seem to represent a more kind of generic biological response to a protracted sense of threat or insecurity. And over the last 10 years or so, as we've been studying this, um, we've learned actually a fair amount about how these changes in gene expression come about in these white blood cells. We know, for example, that much of this particular um, shift that I just described is driven by fight or flight stress signals from the sympathetic nervous system, which end up uh, being represented biochemically as the release of norepinephrine from sympathetic nerve fibers throughout the body. And that norepinephrine neurotransmitter ends up interacting with beta adrenergic receptors on the surface of cells. And the human genome, it turns out, is wired to respond to beta adrenergic signaling by selectively ramping up the transcription of genes involved in inflammation, genes like interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor while simultaneously downregulating the transcription of genes involved in type 1 interferon responses and innate antiviral response. So these kinds of shifts, we, you know, I could, I'd be happy to spend the next 60 minutes telling you about you know, the specific residue of the CREB transcription factor that gets phosphorylated to carry out these kinds of you know, sort of wiring diagram events in the cell. But actually, I think I'm going to skip that and um, sort of move on to a, a couple of more, if you will, sort of interesting, compelling, relevant, less biochemical points. Um, one of the other things we've learned is that a lot of these effects take place in one particular subpopulation of immune cells, monocytes, really a, a sort of statistical minority population, typically only maybe about 5 to 10 percent of circulating white blood cells. Nonetheless, they seem to be the specific type of cell that is most <coughs> attentive to this kind of stress biology or the effect of social conditions on what our genome is doing. Um, we've also learned that people living in threatening or uncertain environments, um, as their brain responds to this kind of threat and uncertainty and ramps up activity of these sympathetic nerve fibers, these fight or flight neurotransmitters, one of the places that that signal gets heard is actually inside the bone marrow microenvironment in which the cells of the immune system are continually being regenerated. So every day we lose literally billions of white blood cells um, and so our bone marrow basically works day in and day out to replenish these dead and missing white blood cells, the hematopoietic stem cells that carry out that 
immune replenishment process. Here, this sympathetic nervous system neurotransmitter, the norepinephrine, basically signals them to reduce the production of things like T cells and B cells, big, what I would call smart lymphoid lineage cells, and instead to double down on the production of these more first line of defense myeloid lineage cells like monocytes, uh, granulocytes of various sorts. And so these cells then get released from the bone marrow and circulate through our blood and essentially, if you will, remodel the competition, the composition of our blood in ways that essentially make it more prone to inflammatory responses and less effective at combating viral infections. So by, that, by themselves, these cells don't cause a lot of damage, but when you get some kind of an insult that these immune cells respond to, they tend to do things like inadvertently producing, um, you know, sort of growth factors that encourage metastasis of cancer cells. They get into the brain and produce hyperinflammatory responses that lead to neurodegeneration. They help atherosclerotic plaques build so that heart attacks become more common. They get in the lung and airway and increase inflammation, pneumonia, asthma, even COVID is exacerbated by these dynamics. And as I described earlier, they also systematically undermine the immune system's ability to efficiently combat viral infections. So on some level, this is kind of a recipe for death, right? I mean, you've got the stress biology changing the way the immune system functions in ways that precipitate the growth and development of those kinds of chronic diseases while undermining our ability to combat viral infections. Doesn't sound like a good recipe for survival. Um, and it's a, a recipe for how not to live both literally in the sense of disease risk, but also figuratively because it's evoked in these circumstances of what you could call miserable, unpleasant, threatening, uncertain, precarious lives. So at some point about 10 years or so ago, we also started looking into whether there were life circumstances or ways of living that might instead, you know, sort of um, block these kinds of molecular responses. I mean, if, if living lives of threat and uncertainty isn't good at a genomic level, if it precipitates disease, what kind of engagements in life or ways of being would actually help block those kinds of effects? So this notion of how we should live if we want to be well and healthy um, actually is, is not a new one, not even particularly historically the provenance of molecular geneticists. Um, this is really a story that you know sort of began with philosophers asking how we should live. And as philosophers have taught about this kind of thing, they generally have distinguished two broad types of answers to this question of what is the nature of a good life, a healthy life, a, a life well led. Um, one perspective has been that the good life is an accumulation of lots of pleasant experiences. So you can kind of think of this as Epicurus's recipe. The good life, um, what contemporary happiness researchers call hedonic well-being, is really, you know, sort of the sum total of all the wonderful, tasty meals we've eaten, the funny movies we've seen, the pleasant moments we've spent with others, the accumulation of lots of happy moments, essentially. The other kind of major theme as people think about the nature of a good life is one more kind of historically associated perhaps with um, Aristotle, for example, um, when he was describing what he thinks of as eudaimonia or the life that's uh, good, not because it's fun or feeds our sort of mental happiness machinery, but a life that's more sort of uh, driven by virtue, by pursuing some kind of noble goal or objective greater than your own immediate self-gratification, something that's good um, for the world, for other people, making the world a better place, this kind of commitment to some kind of cause or purpose greater than your own immediate self-gratification. So as we were looking initially, uh, you know, I, we started this work with happiness psychologists, and they were very excited about the hedonic well-being part. So um, we had a chance to, to do uh, a study in which they measured hedonic well-being using questionnaires about people's lives that asked them things like, how often do you feel happy or satisfied with your life? Whereas the nature of the questions that tapped eudaimonic well-being were more things like, how often do you feel like your life has a, a direction to it and a, a meaning to it? Uh, how often do you feel like you're growing and becoming a better person? So this more kind of flowery, virtue-laced version of, of happiness. And what we found actually kind of surprised the happiness psychologists. When we plot 
where people's transcriptomes are in kind of the, this two-dimensional space defined by inflammatory biology um, and antiviral biology. You can see the genes that we used in this particular study to metric that two-dimensional space. Well, I've rotated the two-dimensional space and flipped one of the axes so that in general, if you see vectors pointed up, that's a good thing in terms of health, less inflammatory biology, um, more antiviral biology. It turns out people that are pursuing these kinds of virtue or um, you know sort of noble objectives as their route to happiness, their biology looks great. Um, they show relatively high expression of these antiviral genes, comparatively low expression of inflammatory genes. People who report really high levels of life satisfaction and happiness, but aren't getting there through eudaimonic methods, they're not getting to their happiness by some kind of you know pursuit of something significant but mostly by what my you know sort of happiness researcher colleague called cheap empty calorie happiness going to the mall and eating a lot of food and that kind of stuff they look terrible actually surprisingly even though they felt similarly good they had higher levels of inflammatory biology and lower levels of antiviral biology and that that kind of disconnect between how these different ways of being happy are registering at the genome um, and how people actually feel in their conscious experience was kind of a fascinating thing to me. When we asked people how depressed or anxious or miserable they were, um, it turns out hedonic and eudaimonic well-being were similarly good ways of being not miserable. Both of them correlate about minus 0.8 with these measures of sort of uh, depression, anxiety, you can think of them as misery in general. So at the level of our conscious experiences of life, at least at the emotional sense, these two ways of being happy seem to be similarly good. But at the level of genome biology, they were actually strikingly different in terms of what kinds of molecular correlates they had. And since then, we've actually seen in a number of different studies following up on this, the same general pattern. There's something about being engaged in some kind of significant life effort after something that you value, that you think is really good and important, that seems to sort of marshal biological resources in a way that reaches all the way down to the genome as it operates in white blood cells. So that's led us to a number of studies where we start to ask, can we, you know, is there a protocol for making more of this? Can we bottle eudaimonia and get it out there to kind of um, help make the, you know, sort of human genome function in a, a healthier way. Um, and there's two broad ways that people have gone about this. Um, it, as people theorize about eudaimonia, they often think about, you know, virtue or noble pursuits as being, you know, sort of striving to climb the mountain, something magnificent. But it turns out the chief source of meaning and purpose in most people's lives is actually taking care of other people. And so this actually is a somewhat achievable approach um, as one example of this kind of thing. Uh, as we've tried to you know, protocolize this, you can randomize, let's say, older um, adults living in South Central Los Angeles to either uh, be in a control group or to go into their local neighborhood schools and help serve as teacher's aides for kindergarten through third graders. Um, and it turns out that when they go in there and they start helping the next generation, and in addition, you know, forming relationships with other kinds of volunteers as they all strive to, you know, essentially promote the next generation's well-being, their threat-related gene expression profiles look great. They drop right down. This is actually the strongest impact on antiviral gene expression of any intervention we've ever done. So it looks pretty good um, for these kinds of, you can think of them as sort of value-driven endeavors in life. They seem to have these very favorable molecular correlates at the gene level. And that seems to be because of the central nervous system neurobiology that's activated when we try and do good, important stuff. There's one particular circuit of neurons in the brain, um, generally called the ventral striatum, and involves structures such as the caudate, putamen, and nucleus accumbens. Details don't matter. What matters is that when this hoping, seeking, striving reward system in the brain, the system that's driving us towards good things in the future, when it becomes activated, it exerts essentially a neurobiological veto over the activity of the threat-related circuits that actually drive, for example, inflammatory gene expression. So the more of this neural system that gets activated, the less inflammatory biology is going on in our white blood cells. So, you know, this whole connection between stress and threat 
um, and what's going on in our white blood cells probably made sense when the things that stressed us out were also likely to wound us. Um, but uh, you know, one of the tragedies of modern life is that the things that stress us out nowadays rarely wound us, at least literally. But uh, nonetheless, we come wired with this body that still turns on these inflammatory programs that promote cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, and um, atherosclerotic plaques. So trying to transcend this is actually um, sort of one of our, our sort of big missions in the kind of work we do. But it's very clear that the genome actually isn't there to create disease. The genome isn't even there to produce disease. The genome really is there to help us survive and thrive in this world. And so, um, you know, I won't spend too much time talking about this, but there's lots of ways of intervening. We know about the biochemistry enough that we can drug these pathways. Um, wellness practices like meditation can also favorably impact them. But this notion of doing good for the world, I think, is one of the most interesting uh, sort of items on the menu of opportunities we have for impacting these things. And it's not a long time now when, uh, until we're able to actually monitor how people's life circumstances change these genomic processes um, and essentially sort of compute on that. And that will provide interesting insight into individual health and health care, but it also has the potential to give people more insight into how the lives they lead change their molecular physiology and to get this kind of stuff onto the ledger of value in epidemiology and policy analysis. So with that, let me just leave you with the funny idea that as we wonder about how we should live in this life, it may not be totally insane to ask the genome what its opinion is about how we're leading our lives right now. Um, with four million years of success and helping us survive and thrive in this world, it just might have learned a thing or two about the, the best way for us to be in this life. And let me, with that, uh, thank the folks that contributed to this work and hand it over to our next speaker. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Janina Jeff. And as Chris said in the introduction, the title of my talk is 46 Chromosomes in a Mule. And that really hints to what I'm going to be talking about today, which is how racial practices in science is a part of our history and how that has impacted the way we study disease, particularly from a genetic perspective. I want to start with this picture. What we see here is a picture of an enslaved woman who is surrounded by white physicians. And what it really is trying to repicture is the practices that Dr. J. Marion Sims developed. And for those of you who don't know, J. Marion Sims developed pioneering tools and surgical techniques for women's reproductive health. Now, he was really interested in trying to understand certain technologies and practices like anesthesia. And he would do practices, gynecological practices on black women, enslaved black women without the use of anesthesia. In fact, some have reported that Sims cared more about his experiments than actually proving the therapeutic treatment, which means that there was no regard for black life when he was trying to conduct these experiments his personal advantage of doing these experiments um, really is what fueled his work. But his idea that black women don't experience pain is not something that I would say he created on his own. It actually is something that is widely, commonly, mistakenly accepted by a lot of physicians. And this is really based off of the pseudoscience that theories that are based in racism. And so I'll give you a few examples of what some of those might be. So um, British physician Benjamin Mosley once said that what would be the cause of insup insupportable pain to a white man, a Negro would almost disregard. And it is some of these pseudoscientific theories about race and human hierarchy that has shaped the clinical practice today that we see that experienced by non-white people. Some other pseudoscience uh, things that have been widely accepted by physicians 
Another one comes from Samuel Cartwright, American physician. And he stated, when it comes to lung capacity, the deficiency of the Negro is 20%. Other examples from um, U.S. physician Benjamin Rush said, being black is a hereditary skin disease called Negroidism and can be cured. This started to shape the psychological um, the psychological perception of how to treat black patients. But on the flip coin of that, when we think about black patients and our engagement with the healthcare system, there, there is a history that kind of stops at two points. One point is that black patients typically went to the doctor when they were too sick to work. That is the benefit that was the time when they would go to the doctor, not for preventative treatment, but only in a scenario when they were unable to go to work and continue their livelihoods where they either suggested or even have the opportunity to see a physician, or I would say even more modern, would go to a doctor. And the second is what we see here, is that Black people were also seen by physicians if they were used in clinical trials and studies typically without their consent. And there are a lot of examples like this. Um, the Tuskegee experiment is one of them. A lot of unethical practices, very similar to, uh, to J. Marion Sims. And so we try to think about genetics and we hear this racist past of medical, medical practice. When we think about genetics, we share this as well. Um, as Chris stated, I am the host of a podcast called In Those Genes, and my podcast really uses Black culture to teach um, genetics to the Black community. In this clip, we had an interview with, Do with Delon Justinville, who is a biocultural anthropologist, and Dr. Saida Grundy, who is a sociologist. And what we're talking about is what is the history behind genetics? Where did genetics come from? I'm going to play a clip from that podcast, and I, I apologize in advance if the, if the audio is not very loud. We did some tests beforehand, but I'm going to play it now. As defined by Golden, Eugenics was the study of all agencies under human control, which can improve or impair the racial quality of future generations. And the goal was to have superior humans mate with one another to breed out inferior humans. He was a racist who was trying to kill off all non-white people. And there was a bunch of people on board openly identifying as eugenists. But then in the early 20th century, when real life science, that is genetics rolls around, a shift happens. Very many departments, programs, institutions, and even professorships of genetics today, they just renamed from like this institution's department of eugenics became this institution's department of genetics. This professor of eugenics became this professor of genetics. So all this genetics is trash? We got to cancel the whole show? Um, so while genetics itself, I would not argue, is racist, these theorists and practitioners maintained former practices and ways of thought. Science is as socially and politically constructed as any other field. What all of these colonialism era, you know, European empire era thinkers and scientists that show us is that really all of these disciplines can be corrupted to make really wrong assessments in the service of European white supremacy. So that's a clip from that podcast and from my podcast. And we're talking about how these things transcend into what we see today. Some of the creators, for example, Carl Pearson, he's the creator of the chi-square test, p-value test, even principal components, which we use in population genetics. He also established the prestigious journal, the Annuals of Eugenics, which is now called the Annuals of Human Genetics. So these um, the founders of our field were also the people who created and started these racial practices um, that have shaped the field. When we think about where things are today, looking at genetic association studies that are conducted in different populations, we don't see that much of a difference, which means that a lot of these studies are still fueled by racial undertones. For example, when we look at genome-wide association studies conducted from 2006 to 2018, majority of them are conducted in European populations. Now, it's not that European 
populations represent majority of the world. When we look at the panel on the right side, we see that majority of the populations um, of the world, majority of these populations are not of European descent. Majority of these populations are of non-European descent, yet we see that the research that's being conducted is largely being done in individuals of European descent. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the reasons why that might be and get back to these racial undertones. But I do want to mention when we limit studies to European descent individuals, we have huge consequences. One of the biggest things is that the discoveries that we make in these European populations are not easily transferable across other populations, and there is significant consequences. In this example, these are genetic variants that are associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And when we are classifying variants as being disease-causing or pathogenic, they're typically rare by a little frequency. When we look at the same variants in other populations due to genetic architecture like allele frequency and linkage disequilibrium patterns, we see that the frequency might vary. The problem is, is that we are starting to use the associations and discoveries we've made in these large, largely biased studies to predict disease outcome and in some cases treatment for other populations where our results do not transfer over. Now, this is just one example as a black woman, as a black scientist engaging with the field, how one might think, well, hmm, did anyone think to look at how this might affect a non-European population? And what might that effect have on a patient? Patient, knowing that the research that's being conducted and the medical practice that they are, the medical treatment that they are receiving is largely biased simply because studies were not done in diverse populations. But I would argue if majority of the populations present are not even represented, perhaps there is also some negligence there. But one good solution would be to increase the amount of diversity we have in these studies. And that's particularly important because as we increase diversity and we understand that some of the reason why these variants might not be transferable to other populations are due to things like linkage disequilibrium. And so when we do a genetic association study and we see a signal where a variant or a region in the genome is associated with the disease phenotype or outcome in a European population where large, uh, where we have large linkage, linkage disequilibrium blocks, we may not be able to distinguish a causal variant. However, if we expand this to diverse samples, we'll be able to understand um, which variant could be disease causing. And so in this example, I'm showing a, just a really, just a quick highlight of different LD patterns between different populations. But I wanna just continue to emphasize that genetic architecture and allele frequencies tell part of the problem. When we misclassify these variants though, we can suffer huge consequences. So this is another example where we are adjusting, where we are looking at different types of pathogenic and non-pathogenic markers and trying to understand the inflation that could be caused by, um, by misclassifying these variants. And so Inflation increases as a level of supporting evidence of the variant decreases. So in each of these sets from set one to set four, set one being a list of variants that has the most clinical significance to set four, we see that there's huge inflation that happens um, when we have less clinical information in a, in a given set. Now, this inflation can be explained by the burden of rare variants. And so rare variants has been the main contributing factor for this inflation. And Rare variants are also population specific. So one might think if we include more populations that we can reduce this amount of inflation. And we see this from the figure on the left compared to the right. But is this telling the full story? Is this enough? Well, when we go and we start to think about let's starting to recruit, we have to remember that while genetic architecture and getting the allele frequency differences will help us with some of the story, it may not explain all of it. And so increasing the sample size Increasing sample size won't necessarily end health disparities. It will highlight and bring to light some of the health disparities that exist, but more particularly might bring to light that the health disparities exist themselves, not due to genomic differences, but due to inequity in our healthcare system. So we have to ask, are we looking in the right place? 
Now, one of the one of the things that's really encouraging is that we are trending away from using things like race in population genetic studies. But one of the things that is not changing is the things that we are choosing to study and the people studying them. Now, if we increase the sample size in these populations, we, have, we also have to increase the amount of studies that we are doing that are directly impacting the populations where the health disparity exists. When looking at the grants that are funded by black scientists versus white scientists, we see that there's huge gaps between the two. And in this paper, it's described that one of the main reasons is the research interest of black scientists. So simply increasing our sample size is not enough because if we don't have black scientists asking the right questions, if we don't have non-European scientists asking the right questions, having those research interests, um, those research questions being funded by the NIH, we won't be able to completely understand these health disparities or things that we don't even know about that have yet to be studied. And so in this example, you can see the amount of, um, uh, the amount, the, these word clouds of, um, word clouds by the amount of NIH funding by what a black scientist and white scientist, and what you can see is a large majority of the black scientists are looking at health disparities themselves, are asking these questions, but this is highly underfunded compared to basic science research of their white counterparts. And so asking the right questions, having a diverse workforce is part of it, in addition to increasing that sample size. But what about the technology? What about the things that we are using to ask the questions? If these tools are also biased, then increasing our sample size won't be enough. Increasing our diverse workforce won't be enough. Asking the right questions won't be enough if the tools that we have are inherently biased and also develop through racial practices. What I'm showing here is a system called Compass, and Compass is used in Florida to decide whether a person who was previously charged with a crime would create a crime again. This algorithm goes through and it has been found that it has a large proportion of false positive being misidentified as high risk. As you might guess, the false positives are largely black, black and brown. And these inherently racist algorithms are just one part. Now, this is not a genetic study, but we do see that these algorithms being put into practice for clinical care can be problematic and can yield the same bias. As an example of that, one of the largest and most typical examples is a class of commercial risk prediction tools used for 200 million people in the United States. It targets patients for high risk healthcare management. And these patients, if they have enough risk, are then put into this program and are um, then are given a, a completely different path to help mitigate um, their health, their health risk for certain things. Now, this algorithm in um, this algorithm is supposed to look at chronic conditions. And when we're comparing race between black patients and white patients, we see that any patient that has an algorithm score of 55 or greater would be defaulted into that program. Now, when we actually look at the fraction of them that are being put into the program and the fraction of them that have a high risk. What was noticed is that a lot of the patients that were being defaulted into the program were majority white. And they were majority white because the algorithm was quantifying the chronic conditions and the risk by the amount of money or health care or, or, or things that are noted in the EMRs. So it was actually directly a, a depiction of how much health care you received. And if there's inequitable health care, then by default, this algorithm would be biased and be excluding people who have a large amount of chronic conditions that are not captured using this method that is based on health care treatment. Now, when we're talking about increasing diversity in research, and we are talking about how we engage and how we um, how we start to recruit patients, we talked about increasing the direct diversity work first. We talk about we have to create new technology. We have to be the creators of these technologies so they're not biased. And we also talk about learning new things from the genetic architecture that is unique between populations. But one thing that we also have to do is we have to end transactional, um, transactional relationships with our participants. And so 
In this figure, I'm showing um, data flow, so collection, storage, and access. And I'm showing a diverse research program, the NIH All of Us program, which has a huge diversity effort. And it's collecting the data and we'll store the data, but who will have access to the data? A few years ago, we saw 23andMe, and even in the past year, has been using their data set to sell to pharmaceutical companies. So pharmaceutical companies getting direct access to the data that is supposed to be created to prevent health disparities. But as we all know, pharmaceutical companies are fueled by things such as capitalism, and it's not guaranteed that the discoveries that are made are actually going to be um, beneficial to the population populations being used to make them. And so in this paper, it is suggested, and I strongly support this suggestion, that not only do we engage uh, scientists, we as scientists engage with communities for our own scientific and professional benefit, but we actually have to be invested in these communities. And I think we have to have these difficult conversations to really understand what is the collective interest of the community and how can that be broken down into an individual interest? Because when we're thinking about precision medicine, it's not just at the population level, but we really have to get at the individual level. We have to understand these varied interests in order to be able to successfully recruit. And that goes for a long, long, long conversation, an entire ecosystem, a lot of which I've described today. We have to confront history. We have to be transparent about the things that have happened in the past. We have to understand culture. Culture is extremely important. And we heard in the last talk, there are a lot of things that are connected to our biology and our sociology. We have to understand these things in order to engage with communities, but also to ask the right questions. When we think about recruitment and we think about inequity that already exists, the immediate need and direct benefit has to be addressed. So far, we, and through this transactional approach, are not really concerned about the communities. We're not really concerned about what their endpoint, what is important to them that goes beyond the medical system given the history of their engagement with the medical system. But most importantly, and a thing that I talk about in my TED Talk, which is where this photo came from, we have to genuinely want to promote futures of our participants. They have to be equal partners in our relation in our research community. We have to be able to engage with them. We cannot create a culture where we have professionals and academics are the only holders of information. And so we have to genuinely be invested in the futures of every community that we engage in. And that's extremely important. We also have to understand how those communities shape these populations. We have to understand how these populations and some of the things that happen within these populations to understand things like emotional awareness and stress. And we have to understand the current state of the things that these populations are dealing with. I say all the time that maybe the phenotype that we're really trying to understand is the side effects of racism. Maybe it's the social implications in combination with the genetics that really will help us understand the true heritability behind any disease. And until we get to that point in understanding everyone's individual um, individuals' concerns and needs and the community's needs, then we can recruit more patients into diverse studies. We also have to create new platforms. We also have to create new technology. We have to be the creators of these things so that they are not biased so we can answer these questions. It truly is an entire ecosystem. With that, I want to leave you with another clip because it could seem that there is not a lot that could be done, but there is a lot that could be done. <laughs> there is a lot. It might seem like there's not. There's a lot to be done, but we are in a very good place and positioned well to do it. And I'm going to play this last clip now. Given all that history, how should we engage with genetics, given what we know about it being fundamentally built from racist ideologies? I think that we first and foremost should not shy away from acknowledging exactly that, constantly reflecting on the ways that it still informs, shapes, and contours how we operate today. It's also about understanding that we're more complex than simple scientific measurements. We should hold genetics in tandem with the other ways of thinking about how we understand ourselves. How do we think of the biological alongside of the cultural um, understandings and conceptions that we've always had. You know, how might you think about 
a genetic ancestry test alongside your family's oral histories. With that, I'm going to end. Thank you. Wow. That was just fantastic, everyone. I thank you very much for those talks. And so uh, not surprisingly, people had a lot to say in the chat. I don't know if you, I don't think you all could see the chat, but uh, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of comments. Uh, one of the things, of course, people said was that they loved your uh, podcast, uh, uh, Janina. Uh, and of course, everyone was very impressed with all of the data and all of the information that was provided. So I'm going to do my best to, uh, to ask some of the questions that uh, people uh, had. Uh, and so uh, going in order, since Dr. Cole went first, I'm going to uh, pose this first question to him from one of the audience members. Uh, that This audience member uh, has, has uh, co uh, coined a, a neologism. You'll be ready for this, I hope. Uh, this person says, are the hedons compensating with food and drink because they are genetically inflamed and self-medicating versus the eudons who feel nimble enough to get out there and help others? That's a great question. So in these studies that we do, you know, sort of in this kind of research context, we can measure, you know, are they overweight? Are they eating a lot? Are they, um, you know, sort of taking drugs of abuse more often, smoking more often, that kind of stuff. And we can account for that and still find these kinds of effects. So at least the major sort of intermediate risk factors or risk mechanisms that would come with, you can think of it as the hedonic lifestyle, the traditional, you know, rock and roll kind of concept. Um, that, that doesn't seem to be the sole mechanism of these. We still find these associations even above and beyond those effects. But there's lots of other aspects of this more kind of live for the moment, be happy, live fast, die young kind of mentality that are just harder to metric. And so um, that I think remains an important component to this as we think about, you know, sort of what does this mean? How would we take this information into account and make use of it? Um, there is a lot to be learned about, you know, sort of what the mechanisms of these kinds of relationships are, but I don't think that it's gonna come down to one simple answer. I think it's gonna be a blend of differences in how people live their lives, differences in the kinds of, uh, as, as Dr. Jeff was talking about, the cultural components that people find themselves in. That can be communities, that can be family contexts, versus you know these more hedonic lives often lead to a little bit more smaller networks, more alienation and kind of greater risk when you do get hit by some kind of a, you know, significant personal misfortune. So I think it's going to be kind of complicated, but that, I like your hedons and eudons. And uh, I think we'll, we'll try and label our figures like that in the future. <laughs> Thanks very much. So uh, Dr. Jeff, uh, one of the questions that was, was, was brought forward is to ask your thoughts on modern day on modern day eugenics, and the example was given as the ORCID program. I, I don't know if everyone would certainly agree that that being a eugenics program, but nonetheless, I'm sure that you have seen and will continue to see modern day eugenics processes and programs. So what are your, your thoughts on those? And if you would comment on the ORCID program, please do. Yeah, I, so I won't comment on the ORCID program specifically, but at a, at a very high level, you know, I think that we have to be honest and say that modern day eugenics never really went away. Like it hasn't gone away. It just has different names and is kind of done differently. I think though, we'll continue to see things like this. If we don't really start to address why we're trying to do these things. And I think we have to be very upfront about the fact that even modern day, a lot of people benefit from racial hierarchies and benefit from hierarchies that are created in our in our social in our social lives. And so, until we start to really do away with them, we'll always see different forms of eugenics evolve and and, and happen. And, and as long as we have inequity, those things will continually disproportionately affect one population versus another. Right. Uh, thanks. So Dr. Cole, uh, uh, a question for you uh, is this, uh, the questioner asked if there's a baseline difference between the hedonic, I wanted to say hedons, between the hedonic and eudaimonic groups in regard to people with children. 
Are our bodies being rewarded by having children, uh, giving ourselves a purpose? You know, that, that probably is true, believe it or not. Um, the purpose results, one thing that's very clear is that there, there isn't any privileged purpose that's better than another purpose at this point. That, you know, we're, we're early in the research, so we may find versions of purpose that are more rewarding uh, than others. But uh, in terms of their biological impact, it doesn't seem to matter a whole lot whether your purpose is taking care of this family, taking care of these kids, taking care of a community around you, uh, running a successful business that makes other people happy and makes life better in certain ways, or, you know, finding solutions to big societal problems or, you know, sort of uncovering new terrain through science or other forms of exploration. Even artists seem to be able to kind of plug into a eudaimonic thing where they're essentially kind of painting from the heart as opposing to, you know, painting to get paid or something like that. So this notion that, that you know, there, it, the, what's important about the purpose is that it's meaningful and valuable to the person who's pursuing it, because that's the brain that it actually controls our, our threat signals getting vetoed before they go out into our bodies and kind of, you know, condition us for disease and change genome function. Um, but that said, there seems to be something special about parenthood that sets genomes in good directions, at least in immune cells. I can't testify to other, you know, sort of tissues in the body, but the immune system of parents seems to be particularly good at controlling viral infections. We've seen that even in the coronavirus era that parents, you know, get sick and get seriously ill and die less frequently than you would expect based upon their rates of simple viral infection. Apparently because parenthood, you know, parents have stronger antiviral pushback. Whether that's because of eudaimonia or whether that's because of changes in exposure to pathogens that work as sort of low grade vaccination is a question that's still kind of up in the air. But the, the simple connection you're making really does hold in the data. Parenthood is great for the immune system. Great. Thanks very much. Um, so this is a question for Dr. Jeff in regard to research on uh, VUSs that may be found more commonly in uh, populations from people of color, uh, are they more, less, or equally likely to be reclassified compared to the VUSs that we see in majority or Caucasian populations? Yeah, I think there's a lot of work in, that's being done right now on, on VUSs. And I would say, I actually don't know off the top of my head, so I don't want to say, <laughs> I've, I have read some papers about it, so I don't want to be wrong. But from what I've seen, you do see reclassification of VUSs um, more so in, um, in non-white, not, I'm sorry, you see more variant VUSs in non-white populations compared to others. I do think though that there is a lot of promise in trying to understand this by expanding it to other populations, but that proportion is still high just because we don't have a lot of information there. I think as we continue to get information there, we'll see a lot more of that, especially in non-European and understudy populations. I'm not sure if that fully answers the question, but <laughs> that's, 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 my, that's my prediction so far. It certainly seems to make sense and be uh, intuitive, that's, that's for sure. Um, Dr. Cole, another question for you uh, is this. Um, well, the questioner has said that there's been a lot written about effective versus detrimental or not so effective mentoring. And uh, this person uh, says that perhaps it's simplistic, but is it, is it possibly true that effective mentoring embodies more eudaimonic elements uh, while the behaviors of some mentors, uh, more pushy, bullying, perhaps harassment, uh, seems more self-gratifying or hedonic. Are there any studies that, that you would recognize uh, uh, or know about in the context of mentoring and uh, how that uh, might play into the work you've done? That is a great question. Uh, there's not a study that tackles that question um, in, you know, sort of a, a, what I'll call a near peer mentoring context, like a, you know, sort of college professor with undergraduates or a, you know, senior researcher with junior faculty or something. The closest we have to mentoring studies 
are things like that graph I showed from the um, Generation Exchange Program in South Central LA. So they characterize their essentially sort of retiree age teacher's aides as mentors for these K through third grade kids. Um, and, you know, as you saw from those data and lots of others, uh, they, they, you know, they look great. It's very good for them. Um, I doubt very much that these, you know, sort of grandmas from South Central LA are going in there to help in the schools because they think this is going to burnish their CV or something like that. They really don't care about that stuff. So they seem fairly intrinsically motivated, both to help the kids and they really appreciate the community of fellow mentors that they kind of fall in with. That becomes a big component of their lives. Um, and so I would say, it, you know, that's when we can see the effects clearest. And I do, I mean, you know, my intuitions would match yours. We just don't have very good direct measurements of this more self-serving instrumental form of mentoring um, that we can use to kind of empirically, you know, so actually validate what I, I agree with you. It seems like the, the sort of likely connection. Great. Thank you. So this, this is, um, well, actually I'm going to, I'm going to uh, propose this uh, question to Dr. Jeff and, and uh, the question I ask, if you think that some of the issues that you're talking about could be addressed at the funding agency level, uh, you know, perhaps relooking at what's being funded, changing the thought that everything funding funded needs to be basic science. Uh, how do you see funding agencies being able to, uh, this is my take on the question, uh, promote uh, what's needed to increase diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, I actually think that that's one of the bigger things that could be happening that's not happening. Um, there was a, pu a paper published by Cell February of this year, and it talked about the funding gap, and it talked about what it would take to fix that funding gap, which is a tiny, minuscule part of the NIH budget. And so we've seen the NIH decrease and close funding gaps for things, for example, senior investigators and early investigators just by you know, using these funds in order to do so. Those similar things could also happen um, if we think about this holistically. So when I say increasing the funding gap, it's not just about also increasing the amount of grants that are going beyond basic science and are studying health disparities themselves. If those health disparity research programs are not diverse in their workforce, they're likely not going to be as successful at dismantling and understanding those health disparities. And so I think the thing that we have to really shift even when we start to address the issue of funding is who is the funding going to and simply asking the question is not enough. Like I said, simply increasing the sample size is not enough. There are so many different elements that have to be incorporated. But I do think that, you know, increasing um, the amount of grants that are funded to do health disparity work, particularly to non-European um, investigators holds a lot of promise in the next step in doing this. So I do think that that is one of the things that I think the funding agencies have not done as great of a job at. But again, there are a lot of research out there that shows that there are a lot of uh, solutions that could be made by doing that. Great. I, I'm going to, I think we can get in one more question for Dr. Cole and the final one more question for Dr. Jeff. Uh, relatively short answers potentially, though uh, all these questions are expansive in, in, in what they address. So, Dr. Cole, you mentioned that parenting is good for your health. Do you know if there's any difference in biological and adoptive parents and, and the, the health benefit? I don't know that, um, I'm certainly not familiar with any direct research on that, so I can give you a really quick no answer, at least as far as I'm aware. <laughs> well, that keeps the trains on time, but that, that's fine. That's no, no, no problem at all. Uh, I, I think it is interesting, isn't it, though, that, it, that, that perhaps the biology might influence things. Obviously, the biology is different, and and, uh, and and there might be different uh, responses. So, so circling back to you, Dr. Jeff, uh, you, you, we were going to touch on the ORCID project. I think that, that, that you might have left that out. So if you have a final thought on that, I think that the questioner and audience would like to hear that. Yeah, um, actually, you know, we're going to be talking about gene editing in season three and those implications of, of kind of like what this next stage uh, can, can, the problems that can pose. I think that we have to be very careful. Um, I think it's a very slippery slope. 
I think we would be silly to not acknowledge it as problematic. And I think if we continue to do these things, we're exacerbating the problem. We're continually avoiding um, the issue. So that are, that's my thoughts on it. I, I think that <laughs> I don't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm a huge supporter of it. And it's not because of the idea of it itself, it's more so because of the lack of effort that's really been like in work that's been done to fully understand what this could lead to, right? When Mark Zuckerberg created Facebook, he didn't think all these bad things would happen. And so we have to be very careful, intentional, and mindful as we do things like this. What are the downstream effects that could potentially make things worse? That's a great answer. And I was really intrigued by your uh, concept and your discussion and your calling out of racist algorithms. And I wanted to ask a question about that, but it's already noon. Uh, it's been such a spectacular time. The questions were great. And of course, moreover, your presentations were just exactly what I think we had all hoped to hear this morning. So hope you have a great rest of the day. And as the weekend comes up, that it's a nice one also. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you to all the presenters this morning. Coming up is a one hour break. Now is the time to visit the many companies in the Industry Solutions Center, view the product theaters, or take some time to view the many posters in the poster showcase. The Genetic Counselor Forum is also being held today from 12 to 1 p.m. After this break, check the schedule for the afternoon sessions and activities that include scientific concurrent sessions and two more breaks that will provide time to view the Industry Solutions Center, product theaters, and poster showcase. Today's sessions will conclude after the platform presentations being held from 5.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. Beginning at 7 p.m., be sure to enjoy this evening's entertainment from Nashville. Get a little preview of the talent that awaits ACMG for the 2022 annual meeting.